Reveal to me in a dream these runes have been. I have heard their songs in my mind, and behind closed eyes I have carved them upon the black roots of thought and memory. A gift from myself to myself, from myself unto you. These have great power and ancestral meaning. Or they mean nothing at all, and the mere suggestion is enough to convey a sense of power and worth and an appealing mystical feeling and spellbinding sensation. <laughs> But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm Ari Thurger, and today I'm going to talk about an absolutely fascinating archaeological finding from Denmark, the Odin of Lyre. Today I shall present to you a silver figurine which presents the seat of Odin. I want to briefly touch on this particular subject as a sort of introductory video, as a support to future videos concerning the god Odin, as well as Seidr, and the seat, stool, platform, or any other object or surface usually associated with Volur, the prophetesses or seeresses and soothsayers of Iron Age Nordic cultures. Let's get straight to it, my dear friends, shall we? Please. The image you see right here is the so-called Odin of Lyre, currently on display on the Museum of Lyre in Denmark. This is a tiny silver object containing a human figure uh, seated on a throne next to two crows and two possibly wolves. The artifact was discovered in 2009 and most researchers are unanimous in considering that it is a representation of Odin next to his representative animals as they are described in the myths. Uh, two ravens, Ugin and Munin, and two wolves, Gary and Freki. It is to be taken into consideration that Alaire was the ancient Danish royal power centre, the old royal stronghold in eastern Denmark. For this very reason, one of the most um, recent interpretations is that the object was related to a leader, a Danish king in the region of Alaire, in which the representation of this deity would have been a way of reinforcing royal authority during the 9th or the 10th century of the Common Era. As Odin progressively became a virtually exclusive deity of the medieval Scandinavian aristocracy, generally associated with royalty and nobility, this representation may have been closely linked to a monarch, uh, representing himself as Odin. It was not uncommon for a figure in a position of governance or power or authority to embody a prominent deity, becoming the embodiment of the deity in magical religious moments, mainly of a celebratory character. Perhaps this representation is just that, a magical religious iconography evoking Odin, understood as ruler or king of the gods, an idea that progressively becomes more rooted in Scandinavia due to the close contact with Christianity and a Danish king being the very representation of Odin on earth. In fact, European iconography in the 10th century presented kings in long robes and seated on thrones, so this particular figure being Odin or a Danish monarch, or both, might even be a syncretistic presentation of a Christian emperor. God's representative on earth, as it were, which in this case could be a Danish king dressed up as Odin, as Odin by this period would be the closest deity to represent a divine monarch due to the Christian influences as Odin progressively became, as I said, a god exclusively linked to Scandinavian royalty, aristocracy. This religious idea has precisely parallels with the European Christian kings, a religious political statement quickly adopted by the Scandinavians as well. Just as the Christian king was seen as the representation of the divine on earth and indeed understood as a monarch and holding that power ordained by God, uh, this political system may also have been adopted in Scandinavia. And Scandinavian kings uh, were thus also understood as the personification of the pagan divine entity which is the most similar to a monarch or so understood at the end of the Scandinavian Iron Age, that being Odin, of course, at this period of religious transition. 
In several literary works, including German chronicles and some sagas of the period, many Scandinavian kings traced their lineage directly from Odin. Swedish kings, for instance, as an example, not only considered the god Freud as both their god and ancestral king, and indeed Swedish royalty of the late Iron Age thought of themselves as direct descendants of Freud or Frodi or Ingvi or Ingvi Freyr, uh, but also in ceremonies of a divinatory character, it wouldn't be strange to witness a figure of authority and power becoming the embodiment of a divine figure such as Freyr and indeed wearing a mask of the deity and becoming the representation of the deity in human form. And through the human mouth, the deity would speak. So indeed, this outstanding figure in may be the representation of Odin, but also of a monarch as the representation of the god of nobility by the spirit, Odin. We are, after all, in the presence of a figure found in one of the oldest seats of power of Danish royalty, Laire. But this figure may be more than that. So, in 2008 and 2009, the archaeological excavations in Laire, Denmark, in one of the largest mid holes ever excavated, has revealed a small silver figurine or statuette, which may indeed be the representation of Odin. I am probably repeating myself, my apologies, but I have recently turned 34, so have patience and respect for the elders, please. So, um, we can see in this wonderful artifact the representation of two wolves or wolf-like creatures from the back of the lyre chair, uh, while two three-dimensional birds sit on the arms of this throne-like seat. What makes this piece quite unique is the fact that the chair or throne is occupied by a figure, except of course, for a more recent finding of a chair amulet found in, on Lowland um, in Denmark. A chair with two ravens and an abstract figure, which is another curious finding. But there are other examples of chairs and stools uh, that have been found in other archaeological excavations, many of which sort of amulets, tiny objects, representative of such seats or thrones or stools. Although. This is a unique finding, nonetheless, because it has a figure seated on it, unlike the others, which gives us more details about this object and its possible functions and what may have been the intended representation. Due to the representation of two ravens that seem to be looking directly at the seated figure and the wolves in the back as decorative elements of the chair, the seated figure has been assumed to be Odin which would also make sense given the very interesting fact of one of its eyes has been scratched or scored out. We know from the myths that Odin has sacrificed an eye in Mimir's well, so this is perhaps the best indicator that gives us the impression that this is indeed a representation of Odin. However, uh, as obvious as it may seem, judging the character of this figure by its eyes alone isn't that simple. Uh, on a more thorough and close study of other figures uh, of this period, we see many similarities in these representations of the eyes. And indeed, many authors have pointed to this particular detail. Several archaeological materials depicting various figures, regardless of gender associations, shows that the ocular theme was part of several performative practices connected with prophesying and soothsaying associations, and not just an artistic detail that could point to an immediate association with or to Odin in the myths. In fact, Odin's sacrifice of an eye can very well be a representation of the ability to see both the realms of humankind as well as those of the spirits. Divination arts such as Seydre and figurines associated to such a practice often display this ocular characteristic. And Odin was indeed a god also associated with Seydre, as you know it, uh, as, and as we shall see further ahead. Also, Odin, who, according to an Icelandic saga from the 13th century, sat on Hildskjalf, and from there he looks across the world, sending his two ravens, Ugin and Munin, traveling all over the world and back to report whatever useful information they would gather. So it's, it is a reasonable assumption that Odin is the figure sitting in this chair. However, 
others have looked upon this figure and have seen a representation of Freya. She is, after all, the goddess of magic, of the divinatory art of Seder, and unmistakably we can see feminine gender signals by the choices of clothing of this figure. Due to this very important detail, it isn't possible to determine the sex of this figure, which may indeed be on purpose. So please, let's see. The figure is represented by what seems to be a long gown with a decorative border, uh, with multiple strands of beads around the neck, covered by a cloak or shawl. This entity is wearing some sort of head covering as well, perhaps a scarf or cap, and seems to have two neck rings. In terms of facial features, however, there's no mouth, only a flat nose and the two eyes, one of which, as said before, purposely damaged. Without a doubt, there are several feminine elements present in this figure and several garments that present feminine traits as well as women's clothing of the period. No doubt that this is meant uh, to be Odin uh, and it is to be underlined here that the, the practice of cross-dressing is often associated with Old Norse sorcery, especially with Seder. Something I should definitely like to discuss on some other future video. But suffice it to say for now, uh, in the surviving sources it isn't uncommon references to men practicing Seder and uh, often being called effeminate, some of which taking on the role of women, not just cross-dressing but also a very important transgender character to it that seems to have been part of the Seder performance by men. I've spoken about this before very briefly, uh, not only in the video I've made about homosexuality in the Viking Age concerning the term ergi, which seems to have been far more than just an insult for men practicing magical arts, usually related to the feminine and to women's society. And it is also quite possibly the term for a magical practice in which the male practitioner goes through a gender transformation in order to assume the feminine aspects required to perform this type of magical performance. But I've also talked about this transgender aspect uh, in the video I have made about the number three and the number nine in Old Norse mythology. I mean, I think it's noteworthy to mention that the divinatory art of Seder in the sources is almost always connected to the feminine and its practitioners are usually women, but the men are not excluded and are thus often referred to as effeminate or with a certain effeminacy to their character. This isn't just restricted to humans, but also to deities. Odin, precisely, is the only male god practicing women's magic, Seder, and thus often accused of being a woman or effeminate or indeed becoming a woman. Bear it with me, please. <laughs> Odin, in the sources, is well known for being Ergi and Hargre, his association with homosexuality and transgender, or at least gender shift, is well known in the sources. Odin is the only male god of Norse mythology who is also the god associated with Seder, overall considered women's magic or feminine magic. Although the sources, both mythological and historical, also speak of men who practice Seder and are often labeled effeminate. And there are instances in the myths that suggest that men either cross-dressed or became women in order to be part of and practice Seder. One of Odin's names is Yalgr or Yalkr, Gelding, as well as Gelnir, eunuch, which suggests the loss of the phallus, which is something we understand to be part of a man's sacrifice to become a woman in order to practice Seder and this is also seen with other male gods such as Freyr in the account of the loss of his sword in order to be with his wife Gerdre, which means enclosure. This myth of Freyr su suggests the, um, the male figure having to become a woman in order to enter the enclosure of the goddess. In other words, practicing Seder and enter a women's society, thus becoming a transgender woman. There are indeed a great amount of accounts in which Odin performs ritual or cultic ceremony or sacrifice in order to have contact with goddess figures and being 
or to begin the process of initiation to acquire sacred knowledge from feminine entities, which bear striking similarities with the accounts Fjolsvin's Moll and Skirni's Moll, in which the male figures through a nine days trial or nine ritual steps leads them to the other world where a goddess figure inhabits. In Skirni's Moll, Freyr endures nine nights to be with his bride Gerdr, meaning enclosure, which reflects the same parallel in Fjolsvin's Moll, as the hero Svipdagr, through nine spell magic songs, reaches the other world where Menglod, Freya, inhabits, surrounded by a wall of fire and a wall of clay, another enclosure. Now, a requirement to wed Gerdr is the sacrifice of Frey's sword. He needs to lose or abandon his sword in order to be with Gerdr. Frey spends nine nights enduring the waiting to be with his bride, which the source specifically says that this waiting time is very painful to Frey. And in the process of waiting, he loses his sword. And only then, after the nine nights and losing his sword, can he reach the realm of the goddess figure. In other words, he reaches Gerdr, which is the enclosure of the goddess, the sacred space of the feminine. A sword is often an analogy for phallus. So what Freyr loses is, in fact, his own phallus. And his death at Ragnarok, the end of a cycle and the beginning of a new one, isn't literal death, but the loss of identity and embracing his new identity, becoming a woman. Freud ultimately becomes his twin sister, Freya. As I said, this bears close parallels with the accounts of Odin involved in women's magic, and indeed Odin calls himself Yalk, the gelding in Grimnismal, the source, and he is so mentioned in Gilfaginning as well. Again, the idea of unmanliness and effeminacy associated with Seder. Odin is castrated just like Freyr. Whether literally or not, calm down, <laughs> it does indicate the abandonment of male identity in order to embrace a woman's identity, in order to contact the goddess figure, just like Seder was deemed to be women's magic or divinatory art, and men who practiced it were considered effeminate. Argr and Ergi, effeminate and unmanly. Just like Odin, Freyr too has to endure a nine nights or nine days trial, and in this period of time he has to lose his sword, his phallus, in order to reach the otherworldly realm of the goddess figure, Gerdr, enclosure. One of the requirements to be initiated into the secrets of the goddess figure is losing his sword, quite specific. Losing his male identity and becoming a woman, the abandonment of a former identity to acquire a new one, which is often the very purpose of an initiation ritual. Freyr is either castrated or goes through a ritual act symbolically dressing as a woman and embracing a woman's identity in order to be introduced into a women's society, a, a woman's society and practice women's magic or divinatory arts, Seder, by becoming either a cross-dresser or a transgender woman. This is very similar to the nine days of sacrifice at Old Uppsala and accounts of the procession of Freyr's male priests and male devotees who act like women, possibly dress like women, and present effeminacy and the unmanly clattering of bells and the feminine gestures of the male devotees of Freyr, as it is referred to in the sources. This, this also bears striking par parallel sorry, with the account of Thor marrying the giant Thrymbr. In the account Thrymskvida, nine days was the time of betrothal given to, in this account to save the goddess figure Freya. Literally the same parallels of assuming another identity and becoming a woman to step into another otherworldly realm to contact the goddess figure associated with women's magic. A nine days trial, ritual or ceremony of a process to begin initiation at the ninth day is also attested in Njol's saga and Krokarev's saga. In Njol's saga concerning Njol's masculinity, this text says that he is a bride of the ogre of Svinafell and that at every ninth night this ogre makes him his wife. The term ogre and or troll is in relation to an entity possessor of magic power, in this case the spiritual leader or shaman figure 
of the remaining pagan cult at Svinafell in Iceland. Those of the cult are his brides. The same way Freyr is linked to the goddess Figurgerder by losing his sword, losing his male identity. Thor becomes the bride of Thrymr. Odin becomes a woman, Yalk, the gelding, in order to practice women's magic, Seidr. And the priests of Freyr dressed and acted as women, identified themselves as women or transgender women. And every ninth night they become women in Njol's saga. As it says in the text, every ninth night he makes you his wife. The same parallel in the previously mentioned accounts and the nine days trial to be initiated in the magic and sacred women's society of a goddess figure at the ninth night or day to enter in Gerdre, the enclosure as in the sacred space of the goddess figure where only women and transgender women are allowed as such if men want to enter they must become women first the transformation of men into women at nine days intervals is also mentioned in kroka ref's saga in relation to ref's gender identity as it says in the text he was not in character with other men instead he is referred to as a woman every ninth night it's curious to see that male gods such as Odin, Thor and Freyr have accounts in which they identify themselves as women or are forced to become women in order to contact a goddess figure. The very theft of Thor's hammer is the theft of his male identity. Thor's hammer is a phallic object in shape, right? Related to fertility and the sexual act between storm and earth to fertilize the fields, as well as Thor's wife being Sif, the wheat fields which the storm god fertilizes with his hammer. The theft of Thor's hammer is the theft of his phallus, the theft of his male identity, being forced to cross-dress in order to acquire his hammer back. Odin, Thor and Freyr, since these three gods were eventually often worshipped together at yearly sacrifices, including at Old Uppsala, a temple dedicated to the three, they share identical accounts as a form of syncretic faith and cult, becoming involved in each other's cultic practices and their connection to women's society and women's magical arts. I know that for some of you this is hard to digest, but I think this is absolutely fascinating and it shows how much prejudice was created with the coming of Christianity and past mentalities and how people dealt with gender identification was far more acceptable than what it is nowadays after over a thousand years of religious indoctrination from the part of faiths that have corrupted indigenous faiths worldwide. Well, it seems the topic was getting hot and these bugs decided to manifest themselves. Oi, what the hell? Shut it. <laughs> I love animals, but these little buggers are really annoying. <laughs> Speaking about the transgender aspects of Odin, or at the very least, his gender shift capacities, here we are again. There's also an archaeological figure of Odin sitting on a specific stool or throne, which is equal to those found in the graves of Volur and Seidkonur, prophetesses and women practitioners of Seder. Literary, historical and archaeological evidences that link Odin to homosexuality, as well as to transgender qualities and transgender identification. This specific fighting fits well into at least the cross-dressing practice in relation to sorcery and other magical arts in the Old Norse society. This specific figure may not simply be Odin on a throne, but Odin on a stool, chair or platform as the practitioner of Seidre, as this figure is clearly dressed in women's garments. There are some details in this figure that are inconclusive and rather than a representation of Odin, we might perhaps be in the presence of a representation of a vulva, a prophetess or soothsayer, Cirrus, right? I think it is important to remember that written accounts about Volur always points out to particular women who either stand alone or are outcasts or indeed coming from outside the Old Norse society, not just in cultural terms and possibly even different ethnicity, but the Volur often wander alone outside any physical settlement. They are set apart from everything else. 
especially when performing Seder ceremonies. They were usually invited in into a farmstead or community to perform their divinatory rituals or, or ceremonies. As such, I remind you about the case of the Seyd Yaller, the platform which was raised on which the performers of Seyder, or the practitioners of Seyder, would climb and carry out the, the ritual of prophecy. I'm not going to develop much on the Seyder Yaller in this video, as I have already talked about it on a video concerning augury and other divinatory methods in the Germanic world. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was in the second part of that particular subject, so if you have the time, please do watch that video. <laughs> uh, suffice it to say, <laughs> there are a couple of references concerning the seat stool or even platform for the vulva to sit on and perform the ritual. One of the best examples is perhaps the account Eric's Saga Ruda, of which I've also talked about previously on another video. A specific platform is raised for the sole purpose of carrying out the Seder ritual by the vulva who is invited into the community and on the special platform she begins her chanting. In Rov's Saga Kroka, Heidre and Skold also sit on a high platform inside of a black tent which seems to have been set up on top of the Seder Yaller. But it isn't just women who performed this ceremony. In Gisla Saga Sursonar, as well as in Lextila Saga, men climb into a Seder platform to perform the Seder ritual. And there are a number of accounts that tells us that this performance on a platform wasn't solely restricted to one individual, but several people could perform it together. Such is the case of, or in, Gonku Rov's Saga, in which 12 male sorcerers sit upon the platform. In this particular account, the platform is said to have been built inside a building, high up and supported by four posts. I think these are more evidences that show that this particular figurine we are uh, dealing with here today may indeed be Odin as a performer of Seder, or any other figure, performer or practitioner of Seder, sitting on a stool or sit uh, or, or, or a platform or a bench. Remembering that Odin sits on Hildskjalf, on a high place. This could very well be a platform or simply a reference to Odin being seated on a high place where he is able to see beyond and into the wide world using his two ravens to gather information. His filgur, his tutelary animal spirits. Just the same way the soothsayer in Eric's saga Roda sits on a high platform and the song that is sang, Vardlokur, is a specific chant to call upon the spirit to aid the vulva to see beyond and into the wide landscape as it is described in the source itself that she required the aid of the spirits of the land to know things from afar and to know future events. The Seder Yaller on several occasions has been seen as a synonymous with both the Heuseti, the high seat, as the place of honor in the Germanic hall, and also with the Tullur's chair spoken in the Hofomal. The Tullur is a, is a sage or wise man or, or poet, someone who recites an orator, someone skilled in the oral tradition and speaks from a high seat to an audience. Odin's high seat Hlitzkjalf could very well be a chair, throne, stool, bench or platform raised on a high place. From this chair the god has a supernatural view over all the worlds and he shares this place with Freya and Freyr, both gods connected to Seder precisely. These two gods sometimes sit on the chair alone, sometimes they sit with Odin. In fact, this also reminds me of something I've spoken previously and I promise uh, 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 I will be brief just to finalize this video uh, as I, I don't want to bore you to death. Remember in the video I've done about the cult of the dead in Old Norse religion? I can't quite place the words I have spoken on that particular video, but it is concerning the tradition of sitting on a burial mound. Certain performances within Nordic uh, sorcery and other ma magical arts that required sitting on burial mounds or sometimes crossroads as pathways of the dead, right? From archaeological context, we have a number of cases of burial mounds, barrows, from the migration period, which are not rounded at the top as the ones from the late Iron Age and Viking period. They have been purposely flattened at the top 
to give them an appearance of platforms. You have examples such as this in the burial mounds at Husby and Old Uppsala. Burials with a flattened top, with a, with a slight slope, suggesting a sort of stage in which a particular action would be visible for those standing below. It is believed that in cases such as these, stones were set on the tops of the burial mounds to form a seat, where someone would actually sit, perhaps perform ritual or utter words on a rite or celebration. Again, either a seder platform, say the aller, or the seat of the tuller, uh, an, an orator speaking to an audience. Almost all of Scandinavian burial mounds, even in Scandinavian colonies, such as in Iceland, are situated in close proximity with the local assemblies or things, the whole thingy, the assembly or meeting place, right? And among such burial mounds can be found some with their tops purposely flattened. So it seems clear these specific burial mounds were intended for some public ceremony. Communication with the dead and prophecy delivered through the aid of the spirits of the departed. This is something consistent with accounts of Volur, as well as with Odin, not only as a god related to death and the dead, but in accounts such as Voluspo. He is a necromancer and he speaks with a dead Volva, a dead Sirius, who is awakened from her deathly slumber and speaks of both the past and present and, of course, also the future. The dead sharing knowledge beyond the grave. But for more information on this, on the, the tradition of sitting on a burial mound, Please, do watch that video so I can bore you to death, but with a beautiful background I have chosen to record that past video. Be that as it may, in both poems and sagas, and of course also later folklore as well, there are descriptions of sorcerers and sorceresses who position themselves in places considered to either be the paths of the dead or the dwellings of the dead, and presumably sitting on chairs or thrones, stools or platforms on a high place to perform the Seder ceremony. And have we not, after all, at Sanda, Gotland, Sweden, a very interesting runestone depicting just this, Odin sitting on a stool on a high place with other two gods? Perhaps portraying the myth of Hildskjalf, where Odin shares the high seat from which the wide world can be seen with Freya and Freyr. But in this case of the runestone, uh, it is Odin with probably either Thor or Frigg, or with Freyr and Freya, precisely. This particular outstanding finding of this figure tells more than what beats the eye at first glance. There's always so much more if we can see beyond our mundane affairs and stare into the wide world and search for knowledge that can only be provided if we look far enough past the horizons of memory and thought. From the ground we may see a beautiful mountain, but if we climb it and stand high on top of it, we can see the vast landscape of multiple realities happening all at once. <laughs> all right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, back for you Thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje. Farewell, my dear friends.